<laughs> Hi, I'm Bart. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the reason I've been working with X since my inception, let me be really clear up front that if I have any bias that appears in this talk, it's because one of my very closest friends, a man named Keith Packard, um, who I went to read college with back in the day, got started with X when X got started. And so my involvement with X over much of its trajectory was sort of hanger on, friend of X, because friend of guy who wrote a lot of X. Um, and so, you know, the nice thing about being a hanger on is it gives you a little bit of perspective um, you know, I, I knew most of what was going on most of the time, but I didn't have to care all the time, and that's a good combination for sort of <laughs> learning things. Um, more recently, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm just stepping down from a pretty long stint, um, more or less since the beginning, on the X.org Foundation uh, Board of Directors, where I was usually the secretary, except when people got mad at me and I had to step down once. Um, so. Um, you know, it's been a good, it's been, it's been a good thing, it's been a good gig, and I sort of feel like with the desktop winding down, and now that I'm not on the X.org Foundation board anymore, I can say things like, the desktop is winding down, and I think it's terrible, and I wish it wasn't happening, and by desktop, let me be really clear, when I use the phrase desktop in this talk, I mean desktop, laptop, Mac, Windows, Linux, I don't, you know, you know whatever, um, is going away. It's being replaced by phones on one end and by browsers on the other end. And that's terrible for open source, which thereby, you know, which means that a 25-year history of subsidized, incredibly cheap, awesome development platforms is disappearing. Um, and you know, it means that a 25-year period of running your applications on the same platform they were developed is disappearing. And yet, here we are. It seems like a good time that's a whole other talk, which I've given before and will probably give again, knowing me. But it seems like a good time to talk about not sort of X for X's sake, but X is an open source project. Because as the title says, this is an Ur open source software project. You may remember Ur, the Babylonian city that is sort of the predecessor of all cities. And yeah. <laughs> Marcus, you may remember firsthand. The rest of you may remember from school. Uh, er, thank you, Marcus. Uh, yeah, this, this, you know, this is one of the ones, right? This is, this is a code base that is as old as GCC, maybe a little older. It's as old as the GPL, um, maybe a little older, depending on how you count. It's, you know, really the largest, really, the, the oldest, really large, really, widely used open source project that we have out there. Um, you know, the, as such, hopefully we can learn something from it that we would learn from studying the newer sort of popular kid on the block projects. And so I just want to talk through a few of those things. As Marcus has sort of implied, um, I don't want this to be a lecture. Uh, it's late in the day, we're all tired. I'm gonna bore you, you're gonna bore me. Please feel free to ask questions, to comment. I'm a professional college professor. It's one of the things I do. And so I can keep the conversation under control. It's your job to sort of actually make it a conversation. Um, I'm happy to talk at you. Don't get me wrong. I can literally talk at you for as long as you can sit here. But, um, <laughs> but neither of us want that. <laughs> um, so yeah, what X is? I mean, there might be some people in the room who aren't super familiar with X. Um, X is the thing that's showing your slides right now. Um, uh, this is a Linux, this, this says Apple on the back, but it, it's, it's running Linux, and on top of Linux is X. If you've ever used Linux um, and used it in a graphical mode, you have used X, because that's pretty much your choices. Um, and it's sort of a large amorphous collection of systems, and so it's hard to define. When I say that, you know, so it started around 1985-ish thing. Um, there, was an, there was a bunch of versions before the X11 that became the real thing. That was version 11 of X. Um, and there was a bunch of sort of different projects and experiments. But, you know, so it's old now. It's 25 years old-ish thing. Um, two million line code base. Yeah. No, it was way before the Macintosh. What it was was built on, I have a history slide that's the next slide, so let me defer your question for about this long, and then we'll, then we'll answer it. But yeah, 
The short answer is no. The Macintosh evolution was parallel. The Windows evolution was parallel. And it's actually an interesting question because, you know, what does that mean to have parallel evolution of all these Windows systems? I mean, what they're all predecessors, or successors to, excuse me, of course, is Xerox Parks, um, you know, stuff. The Alto, Alto Star, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the question was, was X a response to the Macintosh? The answer was no. Thank you. Um, I will try to do more of that. To what? No, not really. No, nothing was a response to news. The response to news was harsh laughter. I can say that after all these years. <laughs> but but uh, no, it was, really, it was really its own thing. So let me, let me do the history, though, on the next slide. I really, I really want to sort of get some philosophy of the talk out of the way. And then one second, we'll do the history. Um, Sort of, yeah, today, this is one of your choices. Um, it's probably as widely used as the Macintosh, maybe more so. It's probably less widely, widely used than Windows, but maybe not as much as you think. Uh, it's hard to know because it's hard to measure this stuff. But it's everywhere. You'll run into it all the time. Um, you might even find it on uh, Jurassic Park. So, <laughs> but the problem with talking about X is, even figure out what the heck you're talking about. I mean, there's sort of, it's the same thing. In the old days when we said operating system, we meant the kernel, you know, what we call today the operating system kernel. Today, operating system has a much broader, oh yes, everything that comes on your computer. Um, the same thing has happened here. I mean, you know, when you talk about an X system, you're probably talking about X plus somebody's toolkit built on top of X that provides services to applications plus some giant set of applications that all work together to provide the epic desktop experience we know and love. Um, there's obviously you know, various kinds of rendering APIs and that kind of, so sometimes, I'll try to be clear, but sometimes I'll be talking about X11, the sort of core two million line thing that makes this all work underneath, and sometimes I'll be talking about big X. One of the things I don't plan to do unless people push me is actually talk about the details of X architecture. You can read about them anywhere. They're confusing and probably not terribly germane to this discussion. So. Um, so I might try to take a pass. Um, and you know, the other thing that X isn't that these other two major windowing systems are, although not as much as they used to be, but for most of their life, Mac OS and Windows were built pretty solidly into the operating system kernel. It was just considered some of the functionality that an operating system kernel provided right along with um, <laughs> access to the disk and management of memory. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The original Macintosh, it was built way in, but uh, you know, baked into something called the toolbox that took up 96 of the 128K of ROM that was in the original Mac. Yeah. Oh, I thought they put it on two files. Oh, no, that's right. They did get it. They squoze it down to 64 for the original. That's right. The bigger ROM scheme later. Eh. Darn. Eh, we'll, we'll make it. Um, so, so, and this is a big deal. This is a big deal because it sort of introduced a model that um, lets you talk about what a windowing system is separately from worrying about what it's running on. That was really important because of the history. Um, here's the stupidly brief history of X. I will go into more detail at points if people want me to, but really this is what you need to know for the purposes of this talk. Yeah, around 1985, there was an operating system from Stanford called V, which I was privileged to run, with a window system called W, which I was privileged to play with, and uh, you know, so the V operating system's W window system inspired some folks at MIT to say, you know what, we could do this on top of Unix. Um, you know, not Linux, because of course it didn't exist by years, but Unix. And we ended up with um, X. And X started out as a sort of an MIT project, but what rapidly happened is that a consortium of workstation vendors who were at the time competing on sort of features of their proprietary window systems, which were incredibly difficult and expensive to build on the hardware of the time and didn't work very well, thought, ah, we could do this thing where we form a consortium and we build a single window system and now we can compete on things other than window system and we can all just ship the same one. Our customers will be happier, we'll be happier. This should be a familiar story, right? This is a story that was replayed a lot over the next 20, 25 years. Um, and they adopted you know, inspired by the Berkeley license, um, you know, that was the BSD license that was around then, they, they formed at MIT and wrote an MIT license, which is sort of a cleaned up based on some lessons from BSD license, slapped that on all their code, 
And off they went to build an open source windowing system. Um, by 1987, um, X11 was really ready to put in the hands of real users. Um, the versions prior to that were big fun to play with, but you wouldn't want to base a, anything around them. And um, the adoption in the workstation crowd was very, very rapid and very enthusiastic, such a strong word. Um, <laughs> everybody, everybody adopted it rapidly because it provided some things that the proprietary Windows systems didn't provide, not just cross-platform compatibility, but quite a bit of attention to the kinds of features that were needed in a windowing system at the time, and uh, you know, a live development community, and the whole open source thing, which was pretty cool. Um, by the mid-1990s, X has a lot more features and functionality. Remember, you know, 1987, there were no color displays. You know, a typical display, display resolution might be six by four. Um, you know, the displays were all small. They all had tubes. Some of you probably don't even, haven't even had tubes in much of your life. And uh, pixels, 600 by 400 pixel displays, sorry. Was the question was, what size? Yeah, no, not six by four pixels, although, <laughs> yeah. Well, the Macintosh, the, Macintosh, the original Macintosh, for example, was, a, was, if I remember right, 128 by 128 pixel display. So, I mean, that gives you some idea of, what? Oh, I'm, I made him completely wrong. Thank you. But 512 by 342, whatever. Tiny monochrome display, right? This is what you're coping with. So by the mid-90s, displays have all moved through um, grayscale plus palette color all the way to 24-bit color. And, uh, you know, some of them have. That's still really expensive, but you can find them. And, uh, you know, the, on the input side, hardware has changed rapidly, um, you know, Everything's, everything's changed a lot, and X has pretty well tracked that. And you know, as the workstation vendors you know, keep improving their workstations, X keeps running on the new improved workstations. But there's this other thing, of course, that's happening in this time frame, the personal computer. And uh, a group of hackers who didn't ever have very cozy relations with this workstation vendors consortium um, ported all this to PCs, and as the PCs started to be capable, started to have things like real graphics controllers and memory management systems, that started to be a reasonable thing to run on there. And of course, as more sophisticated PC Unixes came along, it was only ever mostly on PC Unix. Um, mostly is the right word. But uh, um, you know, th this started to be a viable thing, and you really by 1996, you're well into the X386 era. And there's this whole group of people. Um, at some point during that era, um, there was an adventure that ended up with the X386 folks essentially in control of the development of the X window system. The consortium went through the ownership of the open group and then was disbanded and replaced with X486 uh, essentially. Um, it's a little more complicated story than that, but that's a good first approximation. By um, 2004, there were some epic adventures again, and uh, the X486 version of X rapidly, as in a period of months, uh, was replaced with the current X.org foundation version of X, and the governance model changed again. I'll talk about some of that as we go on. Um, somewhere in that time frame, rendering how X drew was completely rebuilt to um, deal with a modern world in which everybody had through access to 3D graphics, a modern world in which you know, processors were fast and nobody had an 8-bit palette color display anymore. Um, and, uh, but all through this era, rapid, continuous improvement. Around 2008, um, a system called Wayland was proposed, which is sort of the current, arguably most credible alternative to replacing X on the desktop. Let me be clear. In the history of X, every five to 10 years, somebody would announce that they are going to replace X with something better. Um, this is a thing you do at some point, every so often. And, uh, you know, not so much. Um, but Wayland might, be di Wayland might be different because some of the people who are working on it are actual core X developers who know what's going on. And, um, and there's a real strong perception that it might be needed. 
Um, what it's racing against, honestly, as much as anything, I think, is the decline of the desktop altogether. You don't need much of a window system for a desktop that doesn't exist. Yeah, you, 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 you probably don't need X for the tablet. I, I, I'm being hesitant. So the question was, don't you need X for tablets? There would be advantages. Yeah, and I was, I'm being serious. There would be advantages, but the problem is, Part of the wheel here is that when um, the hardware is really crazily cheap, um, really crazily you know, hard to get to be small, cheap, fast all at the same time, then people tend to shortcut build it, putting full-blown feature-rich stuff on it because they can't. Um, it's plus, like I say, I think there's some concern that people have about, you know, sort of, some of X, and that's part of what I want to talk about today. Yeah, yeah, multi-headed tablet. That would be the that would be the epic thing. Well, multi-headed tablet's not a not not a thing, right? I mean, geez, anybody who wants to show slides on their tablet. Um, sorry, the question was multi-headed tablet. Yeah, yes, multi-headed tablet. Um, and so, you know, the tablet vendors are running into the same set of problems that we have we had in 1985 to some degree, but to some degree not. Linux provides, for example, on the input side. Remember, OK, a Windows system is two parts, this, this much architecture we need. There's the part that draws on the screen. That's actually the easy, boring part. Nobody cares about that part, because it's so easy and boring to do. Um, Android's thing for that is a thing called Surface Flinger. It's not very much code, and it's not very hard to get right. Um, the hard part is on the other end, um, it turns out, because input systems are asynchronous, they're multilingual, they're all the, they're a whole list of bad things about this long. <laughs> And one of the nice things about Linux is that a lot of that input system functionality has started to be move into the operating system kernel and not be X's problem anymore. The whole EvDev world makes life a million times easier. But one of the things I didn't want to do in this very brief talk is get technical sidetracked. What I really want to talk about is some lessons that are maybe deeper than the technical lessons. And while I'm happy to talk technology, and everybody who knows me knows that. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I had to go there. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't recognize, that vaguely Napoleonic figure is uh, Keith um, Packard, uh, who I'm sure won't mind too much. Um, <laughs> I haven't asked him, but I'm sure he won't. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Marcus, yes, no, he didn't notice when I put him on the horse. Uh, the, the, the original architect of X actually was not at all Keith. It was a guy named Bob Scheifler who's still around. He's incredibly brilliant, an incredibly brilliant architect who designed and, you know, led the implementation of an, an original system that was really, really, really well thought out. Um, and in fact, over the years, other people have been leaders of X in the political and sort of social sense as much as Keith has. Um, Keith has been, for many, many, many years, the technical leader of X. But the point is that um, if you look at the sort of rise and fall of X's fortunes, if you look at what's sort of happening there, I think what you're going to see a lot of is a lot of um, it depends on who's in charge. Um, and uh, this comes to the point at which in a videotape talk, I have to be really a little bit politically careful. Um, you know, I don't care if see, people say bad things about me, but I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Um, at certain times, the leadership of X has been such that it's really suffered. And uh, you can go read for 15 minutes on the web and figure out which times I'm talking about. And, you know, what, what I see as I look across other projects is this same set of issues. That in the short run, a leader doesn't matter very much. If your leader is completely crazy in the short run, if your leader has no vision in the short run, if you don't have a leader in the short run, an open source project can do very well. What do I mean by short run? Well, two, three, four, five years, right? Um, because in the short run, you've got an army of developers, all of whom are very smart and very collaborative, you know, sort of building something together, there's a lot of energy there, and that energy can carry almost any amount of failure to lead. Leadership's a vision thing. The reason that even though Bob Scheifler was only involved with X for five years, he's so very important, is because he had a vision that really turned out to be a 25-year vision that 
really, really worked. And the reason that Keith's been so important isn't just his epic technical skills, it's his epic vision for where X should go at any given time that tells you sort of, you know, what do we need to be doing in the future? And so if you want to build a project and get it done, probably don't care about leaders. If you want to build a project that has a 25-year lifespan, um, you should be really thinking from the very beginning about who sh who's the right person to lead this product, project. And in fact, I would argue that, you know, and I, it isn't like I can think of a modern example where all this applies. But uh, <laughs> I would argue that in the long run, if you, can't, if you don't have such a leader, probably should just not worry, try to do that kind of a project because you just won't succeed. Let me be really clear. All the lessons I'm going to talk about today, there are nine of them, and I, so I'll ra be racing through them a little at this point. Um, you might disagree. You might think that this is not a lesson or that it's not important. Please speak up. Yes. <laughs> These are my opinions. The thing that Bob did that was the most important for X is very early on he enunciated a really clear f design philosophy for how X was going to be built and you know, what the rules were for sort of architecting and constructing the thing. Rules like, if you don't know how to build it yet, don't try a half version, just don't put it in at all, right? Don't put in things you don't know how to do. That was a really good rule, and they violated it in a couple of places. They violated it with fonts, and they violated it with core rendering. And in both cases, it turns out that they would have been better served to follow the philosophy that <laughs> was introduced. Um, you know, rules like, uh, make everything extensible from the very beginning. I'll talk more about that later. If somebody needs to be thinking about actually explicitly, I claim, somebody needs to be explicitly in your open source project thinking about setting the kinds of meta standards for how are we going to do this? What are we going to build? Because the alternative is what we see in a lot of open source projects today that are sort of politically and socially and technically troubled, which is that you know, there's, a, there's this fire hose of bike shedding and lack of consensus that sort of you put a patch out there and it gets buffeted by the chances of whatever's out there. Nobody's pointing to any criteria because none have ever been written down except their own personal criteria for, well, I hate it when you use three space tabs. You know, it's, it's, the stuff that actually matters gets way cited because nobody's ever reached consensus on how that's going to be. Um, this is one of the things I really love about X, is that if you talk to the X developers, they not only all agree, they all agree because they all have bought into sort of a, some explicitly written down philosophy of what's going on. All agree is too strong, but you get the point. <laughs> and another part of this sort of design thing that trickles down into the technical side, um, you know, this is, um, this is, I swear that interface is a technical rock climbing term, although the internet failed to verify that for me. This is the interface between a climber and the wall. And the problem with you know, interface violations, you notice these are all carefully color coded. If you got one of those wrong, um, you'd probably experience crashes, and that's no good at all. Um, you, really want, you really want to, one of the things that X did really, really right, that you see very few other open source projects to this day to, is that they wrote big documents that said exactly how the interfaces were going to look. Now, that doesn't mean the interfaces were frozen forever because they were really careful with extensibility. Again, more on that later. But it means that interoperability was achieved the way it was achieved with the internet, the way it was achieved with, um, with uh, yeah, a, a few things in the open source community, which is that you had a technical standard. The technical standard was supported by implementations, and they could interoperate because everybody knew what was going on. And you know that was so successful that a few years ago, okay, a lot of years ago, eight or ten years ago, I was in a legal case where I was asked to prove that some piece of software in 1990 would have run a certain way under X. And so I just compiled it and ran it under current X. Worked fine. Um, that's a level, you know, Apple and Microsoft can only aspire to that level of backwards compatibility. Um, the hard interface boundaries really, really help you. And so one of the things that we've learned as an X community is to keep doing that, to keep 
every time we introduce something new, we introduce it with a document that describes how it's going to work and that really describes the API that you're going to use. People talk about, well, you don't need a networked Windows system. That's stupid in 2013. And maybe they're right. One of the ways in which they're epically wrong is what that, la that lets you do is define your API in terms of protocol. And protocol is a really nice way to define hard interface boundaries in a system. If I describe to you exactly what the protocol is that you have to speak to get something to work, um, then you know what the API is and, you know, what the API is the wrong word, but you know what the interface is and you, you know how to conform to it. And that's maybe more important than the network TCP IP transfer system that maybe nobody ever uses anymore. The, sorry, cheesy slide. Um, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a real turkey, yeah, yeah, ham, yeah, yeah. So um, one of the tricks that I think you can draw lessons both positive and negative from in X, but mostly positive. Um, again, the periods during which X has been the most successful has been the ones where it's been the most inclusive where inclusive is defined in something of a funny way. Um, you, you know, we have a technical meritocracy, just like most open source projects do. Um, you know, people without sufficient technical clue are harder to include. But, you know, we've tried really hard for the whole course of the project not to make the project only corporate or not, and simultaneously not to make the project anti-corporate, not to make the project, you know, sort of force people to, to build hardware a certain way, understand things a certain way. And you know, that effort to make sure that everybody who can play along has been a really important part of the process. And the few times that that's gone away, again, there was this event in the middle that you know, was not so happy. The few times that they became less inclusive were some of the most failed times for X. When nothing got done, nobody was happy. Um, you need to find a way to make your open source organization inclusive to everybody who wants to play. Again, extensibility. I've mentioned it several times. It's one of the most important things about X because it was built in from the beginning. The X that you run today is one, X programs from 1985 will run perfectly fine on the X that you run today almost, for the most part, almost all of them will. Um, X programs from today, not so much with 1985 because they're built mostly on extensions to the original X interfaces. Um, it was designed that way from the beginning, and it's worked really, really, really incredible, incredibly well. The alternative to extensibility that X tried early on and that didn't turn out to be such a good idea is generality. Um, this, this device, by the way, is a, Google gave me one of these a few years ago, and I'm very grateful, but it's an interesting device. It's a sort of a configurable Swiss Army knife. You, it comes with a box of blades, and you bolt whichever blades you want into the case to make the knife you wanted. And it, Sounds on the face of it pretty cool, but it fails to achieve, in my opinion, its full potential because you're stuck with the blades that came in the box. And they tried to guess every possible knife blade you might ever want to have, and they put them all in the box, and they said, there you go. There's your set of knife blades. You may have these. Obviously, what you want, if the market would support it, instead is, no, don't, just give me a couple starter knife blades in the box. What I want is the catalog where I can order from an increasingly large collection of increasingly cool knife blades to throw in my knife as time goes on. Blades that initially nobody even guessed I would ever want. That's where we are with X, is that you know, because, in, because after our initial attempts to make it general, we gave up and just started trying to make it extensible, now we're in a position where we have things in X that we could never even have conceived we wanted. Um, 25 years ago. And that's what's kept it alive. That's what's kept it a continuous project. And if your project isn't like that, you're probably failing in the long run, even though you don't know it yet. Um, I don't know any other way to put it. Um, so I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, I can't decide whether this is a CVS user or just a Git. Um, but uh, <laughs> sorry, I had to go there. Um, <laughs> But uh, in either case, um, you know, from the very, very beginning, X was one of the earliest projects to do really serious, real source code management, to use a version control system from the front. We have old, can't read them anymore, clear case archives is how old X's source code management is. There are RCS files lying around um, from early X. Um, 
I'm preaching to the choir in 2013 in the era of everybody's on GitHub. Um, of course, you need epic source code management. But um, I think X was one of the people who helped teach this lesson. And the most recent lesson of this kind, I think, is the lesson that your choice of source code management system actually does matter. It isn't just you need a source code management system. You need one that will do what you want and one that's good. We were one of the early adopters, really, after the Linux kernel, obviously, but one of the early adopters of Git. And that was after a fairly epic amount of survey work and study and experimentation with moving X out of CVS hell into various things. Um, it was a really carefully considered decision because it was viewed as by everybody, especially by Keith, as really, really important to the future that we get that decision right. The decision to move to Git was not made lightly. It was made for a rationale that's captured in pages and pages and pages of notes. And ultimately, Keith, with a little help from me, built a tool, an explicit CVS to Git conversion tool just for the X, pro you know, intended just to convert X because we weren't happy with what was out there. It's awesome. It captures, it captures information you didn't even know was in your CVS repository. But, uh, but you know, it's, like I say, maybe I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe this is a lesson nobody needs to learn because you're already convinced. But if you're not convinced, um, please get convinced because it's really super important. Yeah. Uh, this is a one-tined one uh, barbecue fork. Um, it doesn't show up as well on the screen as I'd hoped. Um, the People ask me before the thing, am I going to talk about the two big events? And I'll talk a little bit and in careful terms about the two big events. The first big event was, like I say, the MITx consortium was more and more, you know, workstation vendors in a workstation economy that was slowly dying, in much the same way the desktop economy is now. Um, the PC world needed to be there. Um, X was first taken over, like I say, by X Open, the Open Group, whoever they were that month, and which was actually a pretty cool organization. But the X for 86 folks felt like they needed their own control and their own governance since they were the ones actually doing the work. And for a long period, that fork turned out to be effective for a reason that's really, really important. You know, when you think about forks, you think about things going in two directions. X forks traditionally haven't been so two-directional. One of those forks gets cut off really quick. It's really more of a transfer than a fork. And the nice thing about open source and open source licensing, and the reason for the people not in the room who are considering open source licensing, one of the real reasons you want to use it, is because it gives the option to transfer control when you need to transfer control by community consensus rather than by some kind of administrative or managerial activity. And that happened in X over its 25-year history, not once, but twice. The second time, um, around 2003, 2004, in that time frame somewhere, um, there was quite a bit of widespread disappointment with X386 governance and development in the community. Um, there were some epic politics that happened during that period. And the thing that made that transfer of control easy was the decision of David Dawes, who led the X386 project, to change the license to a less open and GPL incompatible open source license for X unilaterally. Something he probably couldn't do for a lot of the code, but he was doing it for what he could. And uh, that made it real easy, precipitated something that was already in progress, really. It would have probably happened anyway, but it was a smooth transition at that point because everybody simultaneously said, never mind, we're not doing X386 anymore, we're doing this new thing. And what that did is gave us a chance to get a governance model in place that's completely open. Everybody in this room, by contributing substantially somehow to X, is eligible to become, for free, a member of the um, X.org Foundation. And I encourage you, if you're involved in X at all, to please become a member of the X.org Foundation. They're good people. It costs you nothing. They do good work, and they can use your support. The membership of the governing board is now voted on an annual election. Um, which was badly run partly by me some years. Um, but, but it's a real election with real open candidates. Um, 
we have open governance. We have open meetings that are on IRC. You can come watch them anytime you want. We have you know, completely open, obviously, development. We have some sane policies around commits and that sort of thing. All that happened in a period of less than a year, really, because it was time, because we had an open source license. Without the license, none of it gets to happen. One of the things that X did, pioneered from the beginning that's really, really interesting, and this is one of Bob Scheifler's founding principles of X, is this very, very sharp split between sort of policy and mechanism. The idea that X, the X server, the core X bits, the sort of X kernel, is supposed to support whatever user interface policy you actually can ever dream up. And that you should be able to write user land code that does all those bits and it should work fine is an idea that turns out to be really, really important because it means that there's a nice division of labor. These days, the X community is very sharply divided into the GTK, XFCE, KDE, you know, not in any particular order, um, <laughs> into those camps that do policy and provide user interfaces with a particular look and feel, particular handling of files, a particular that, blah, blah, blah. And then this lower level community, the plumbing community, which is the x.org folks themselves, who just provide policy-free mechanism. And resisting the constant pressure to move policy into the kernel um, or to move mechanism into user land has been one of the key features that has made X work as well as it has. And if you look at Mac, OS, and Windows, again, they've gotten there over the last some years to a large extent, but it's taken them a lot of years to figure out that lesson, which turns out to be a really key lesson. Your project might want to do that too. We throw away a lot of code in X. We, have a, we only have a two million line code base. It would probably be four if we had kept everything. Um, and you know, if you look at the policies around throwing things away in X, there's quite, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty sophisticated, the community's understanding of what, how you throw things away. Um, for one thing, if there's any kind of identifiable clientele for something, you don't throw it away. Um, a lot of our throwaways have actually happened because somebody discovered, and this is hilarious, that a feature had been completely broken to the point where it would never work for several years and nobody had filed a bug report because nobody had noticed. We love it when that happens, because we know how to fix those bugs. <laughs> um, and that includes literally hundreds of thousands of lines of code sometimes. There was a whole color management system buried in Xlib that was like 200,000 lines of code that had been there almost since the beginning of X that had been broken for many, many years to the point where it would crash if you tried to use it. Boom, gone, yay. <laughs> Well, have any opcodes been de-implemented in code? The, the protocol, the protocol, we've never removed anything from the X protocol that I can remember. Now, somebody will probably correct me later, but that I can remember. Um, certain extensions have been deprecated, um, and so that's sort of a removal. And pr for example, LBX, the low bandwidth X extension. This was going to make X work really well over your modem lines, and it was an epic experiment that was definitely worth trying, and it was pretty much a failure for reasons that you can find a paper by Keith P that describes pretty well. Um, at some point, we stopped shipping it. We encouraged everyone not to use it. Nobody supports it anymore. It's pretty well gone. That's another 50,000 lines of code probably just gone. But in principle, you know, there's nothing that stops you from implementing LBX. It isn't like we told you you couldn't use it. And uh, it, that, that, because it's part of the extension mechanism, you could do your own better later thing. The core protocol we leave alone because it's a small, simple protocol that still se is easy to implement and still seems to work fine for some things. Yeah? Uh, what is the policy in like general with things like, uh, like uh, projects within the between other projects like the PMP wrappers? Right. So, th so the question is, you know, we, we have these situations where you know, double buffering is a good example, but you, you brought up the example of uh, sort of virtual X where you know, somebody looks at some implementation and says, you know what, this is terrible, we need to fix this, and replaces it. And sometimes there are several competing implementations. We really are inclusive in the sense of the more the merrier. At some point we had, I think, three different Radeon drivers, for example, um, you know, and that was fine. You know, nobody's, this is open source. We're, we're absolutely happy to let people play and stuff. 
at some point, typically, there becomes a broad consensus. So for example, um, KDrive was a really cool thing for the time and place it was implemented. This was a separate X server implemented by Keith P that provided a really, really easy interface for really simple, small X server stuff. Recently, everybody said, you know what? No one uses this anymore. We're having troubles maintaining it. It's full of bugs. We should throw it out. Oh, but if we throw it out, we have to throw out all this other code that sort of used pieces of KDrive as well. And there was a big adventure around which one should we throw out, blah, blah. And there was a lot of discussion back and forth on the mailing list. And eventually, we threw most of that out. The point is, the discussion was not particularly flamey. I was probably the flamiest person there. Um, but in general, the thing wasn't particularly flamey. It was a bunch of people figuring out what are people actually using, you know, what actually matters, what are the replacements, are the replacements more adequate than the things they're replacing. I mean, these are all basic common sense, but it's really easy for basic common sense to go by the wayside in your open source organization over these kinds of decisions. Part of it, what helps, is that X is pretty good at egoless. Um, I know it doesn't look that way, but compared to some projects, X is pretty good at egoless in the sense that just because people wrote code, most of our developers are, we don't have that many developers. This is something I'll whine about at the end. Um, for a two million line code base, we have 20, 30 developers. Um, the X.org Developers Conference will be in um, Portland this year. Um, it's free for anyone to attend, um, we will have le we will almost assuredly have less than 50 people attend this conference. This is a 2 million line, 25 year old code base, go figure. But one of the upsides of that is most of the developers are pretty mature and they understand the joy of throwing code away and even if it was their code, they're happy to see it go when it's, it's time to go. And uh, you know, I'll hear ex developers all the time going, woohoo, I get to throw this code away. That's, that's where you want to be. <laughs> that's where you want to be. And you, know, you want to be fighting with that way around, right? Where the developer's like, we got to throw this code away. And some other people are like, no, you can't throw it away yet until we do these other things. That's the fight you want to have. <laughs> Let me close with a few anti lessons. Um, there's probably more. These were the ones off the top of my head. Um, there's a lot of things about X that are really hard to use and really complicated and difficult to understand. This is almost always because a single underlying architectural fail is causing a lot of little symptomatic fails that are the ones that you actually see from day to day. For example, you know, there were epic piles of fail around how do I use various primitives in the re and implement and use various primitives in the core rendering, in the core drawing primitives. And that's because the core drawing primitives were just terrible. They should never have, you know, they should, they should have been thrown, ignored, which is our version of thrown out, years before they were. Uh, the, the fix wasn't to get wide ellipses right. That's a whole story. You should go read about it. The fix was, no, never mind. We didn't know how to draw, do, design stuff before. And ultimately, the fix was Cairo, which came along, and Lib Cairo, which came along and showed you how to actually draw things properly in a usable way in 2D, 2D world. Um, the... So that's one. Um, again, you know what I said before. Um, you know, if you're going to try to build two million lines of code with a few people, it's going to take forever, and it's not so fun when you're limiting resources. Oh my gosh, nobody will play. You know, at one point in X's history, we were laughing because there were something like five times as many developers, um, active developers of fetch mail as X. It's like, oh. <laughs> This can't be right. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I, I really encourage you to think hard from beginning. We're trying to fix this now. By the way, if any of you are interested in developing X, talk to me. Uh, we're trying to fix this now various ways, but I wish we'd been paying more attention all along to keeping the size and quality of our developer base up. I wish people were enthusiastic about X. You say, oh, part of the problem is we're plumbing. Well, part of the Linux kernel's problem is it's plumbing too, and yet they don't seem to have any problem attracting as many developers as they are as there are so I mean yeah C is terrible for writing user programs please don't do that um, you can do it and most of X has done it um, and it's sort of a de facto standard now to the point where when I architected a new library to replace an old library Xlib I architected it to have a C API but although now people thank goodness have found ways to use it without the C API so much which is good for them but you know User line programs shouldn't be written in C. It's an error prone, buggy, verbose, um, difficult to maintain programming language. Don't do that. 
Uh, Marcus wants to use C++ instead. He's welcome to it. <laughs> Sorry, I was supposed to repeat the question. Yeah, BCPO. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, like I say, I, I think this barely touches the surface of the anti-lessons, but I'm almost out of time, so we'll probably take them offline. Um, and I, what I guess I want, want to encourage you to do is to pick up this thread with, the ex developers, you know, talk to people. If you're interested in more of this kind of talk, we're, me and other people in the X community are more than happy to talk your ear off on, this, on these topics. Um, do come to the developers conference if you're interested. It's pretty epic. Um, you know, talk to the local X folks. There's a lot of us. And I want to acknowledge some people Keith Packard, you know, who's the reason behind my being involved with X, Jamie and Sharp, and Josh Triplett, who implemented the library I architected that I was just talking about, um, the X.org Foundation boards, developers, all those folks who've just been epic the whole time I've been involved. That's what I had to say. Um, I'm open for questions, comments, and whatever time we have left. Yeah. Some of this, some of some X extensions. So the question was, how do you, how, how in your project do you make your project easily extensible so that people can do this thing well? Um, and yes, some of the extensions of for X were shipped with pretty much as soon as X was shipped. We didn't wait to start building extensions, and that's piece of advice number one. You know, if you don't exercise your extension mechanism right away, you're not going to know whether it's right or not. But yeah, absolutely, there's several specific extension things you can do. One is everything should be versioned, explicitly versioned with version numbers from the beginning. If you don't have version numbers on things, you can't tell, you know, and there should be a mechanism for identifying what extensions are available in a, in a negotiation protocol as part of your stuff. If you don't put that infrastructure in place, you know, and people have to guess by sort of throwing random bits at whatever you're doing and seeing what happens, you're going to have epic fail. I mean, there's a lot of machinery in to support the X extension mechanism. It was all very explicitly built very, very early on. Um, so explicit versioning, um, having, uh, having the right, having the extension mechanism be not limiting in terms of what kind of interfaces it can provide. Because X is a protocol, you can sort of have any extension interface you can think of and implement it pretty fast with you know, very, very minor restrictions. And that's really super important because the kinds, of st the kinds of API or whatever that you're gonna need to implement your favorite extension are hard to guess in advance. So I guess those would be two of the things um, you know, that I would say, yeah, from the beginning. But especially, just pay attention to the infrastructure for extensions and then you'll be able to build extensions. Other projects have done this well. I mean, we aren't the only people who've done it. We were probably the, some of the earliest people who do it. We're far from the only ones. Hi, uh, I want to know, um, it's like an um, how much bike shedding goes on about which drivers to include in the Katamari? How much bike shedding goes on about which drivers to include in the Katamari? Surprisingly little these days because the hardware world has gotten very, very homogenous. Um, you know, this was an activity that 10, 15 years ago was a big epic activity because there's a lot of weird hardware out there. I mean, at this point it's pretty clear. Well, first of all, the Katamari is going away. So for those of you who don't know what the Katamari is, from the very beginning of X, when there was no internet, much less, uh, you know, no real internet, much less, uh, you know, epic things like distributed source code management, um, you know, we build a tarball every so often and send it to you on tape or maybe if you were lucky, eventually you could FTP it or get it from, I don't know where. Um, we've still been building tarballs. These are probably the last few tarballs of all of X you'll ever see because it just doesn't turn out to be a very good model anymore. The, the distro vendors are the people who ship X these days. They just ignore the tarballs anyway and they pull from whatever repos they want to pull from and build whatever they want to build. So the Katamari is pretty well gone, which means that along with that goes, we don't have to make these hard decisions anymore. But even when we did in recent years, it isn't a hard decision. We kind of know which ATI driver we want, we kind of know which NVIDIA driver we want, and we kind of know which uh, Intel driver we want. That isn't a hard decision. And now you've covered most of the world. <laughs> right, so the concern is that, you know, is versioning compatibility between the various drivers. So one of the places where X has been less good 
is in stabilizing driver interfaces. That is absolutely correct. And that's a lesson we should learn from ourselves somehow. But um, recently, there's been a lot of effort to fix that. And if you try to run any version of you know, the, those three drivers I mentioned that was written in the last year, year and a half against pretty much any version of X, you're really likely to have success. As long as your version of X is newer you know, than the, the drivers, you're likely to have success. That started to stabilize. It's just taken time. What else can I help you with? All right. Well, thank you all very much. It was great to talk to you.